everyone, and welcome to the Florida Table. We will be having a conversation with health experts on environmental justice and the climate crisis, hosted by yours truly, Moms Clean Air Force. We are a community of over a million moms and dads united against air pollution to protect our children's health. Through our awesome network of state-based field organizers, we work on national and local policy issues. We meet with lawmakers at every level of government to build support for equitable, just, and healthy solutions for pollution. Today, our conversation is moderated by myself, Gabriela De Silva, a Moms Clean Air Force Florida organizer, and my partner in crime, Yaritza Perez, who is also a Moms Clean Air Force Florida organizer based out of Orlando. Uh, to kick off this conversation, we'll be turning to Yaritza to introduce our panelists on kind of a background of them, and uh, we'll get that started. So Yaritza, I'm handing off to you. Hey everybody, as Gabi introduced me, my name is Yaritza Perez. I'm currently located here in Florida in the beautiful Sunshine State. And like, as we discussed before, we're gonna have a great conversation today and we're kicking it off with Dr. White. Dr. White is a pediatrician with over 15 years of experience caring for the medical needs of children in hospitals, clinics, rural areas, military doctors, in Indian health, telemedicine, international and home-based settings. She does it all. In her desire to address the rising trajectory and root cause of chronic diseases in children, she's expanded the scope of her practice to incorporate environmental health and advocacy. How amazing is that? Dr. White engages with policymakers and medical groups to strengthen public health policies and practices, practice guidelines so that the decisions are based on research, evidence, facts, and common sense. Dr. White began her studies at Howard University at age 16, where she earned her bachelor's of science degree and graduated with honors of school in the School of Medicine. She completed her pediatrics internship at the Medical College of Virginia and Community Pediatrics res Residency at Morehouse School of Medicine. And if that doesn't tell you everything and how amazing this <laughs> is, we're about to hear a lot more. So without further ado, Dr. White. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I'm also a, um, on the steering committee of Georgia Clinicians for Climate Action. I'm very grateful to be here. Yes, we're so happy to have you. And before we kind of get going on our conversation, I just wanted to lay like a backdrop of the Momnibus Bills package. So the Momnibus is a suite of 12 individual bills that address every dimension of the Black maternal health crisis. The, the Momnibus seeks to transform the lives of Black mothers and babies for the better. This act includes legislation that is groundbreaking because it explicitly addresses climate change related risks for pregnant moms or pregnant women, and climate change is a health threat that makes wrenching health disparities worse. Uh, the Protecting Mom and Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act led by Congressman Underwood um, in the House and Senator Ed Markey in the Senate, uh, this act um, has robust investments and initiatives to reduce exposure to extreme heat, air pollution, and other environmental risks to pregnant and postpartum um, individuals and their infants. It will provide direct assistance to pregnant women in high-risk communities by providing all by providing air conditioning, subsidizing home weatherization, increasing the tree canopy, training doulas and other birth workers, and investing in research on climate change and maternal health. This program will pave the way for, for healthier moms and babies, easing the maternal health crisis and while responding to the real and present dangers of climate change. So with that in mind, and that as a backdrop, that comes to our first question to ask you, Dr. White. Um, is there any part of this bill you feel has the greatest impact on families? Yes, um, thanks for asking. I love the part of this omnibus package that focuses on the social determinants of health, like transportation barriers. Not everyone drives access to a car. I've worked in rural communities where there was no bus, train, or taxi. Many were dependent on getting a ride, and some patients had to wait hours for their ride or would have to cancel their appointment at the last minute due to these types of transportation problems. I also like the part of this bill that provides for safe quality housing uh, funding for this. Uh, many pregnant and postpartum women are going to going home to homes that have old aging infrastructure with lead pipes or old poorly functioning HVAC units or using the wrong size air filter or air filters that have never been changed. 
You know, some homes still have asbestos in the flooring, basement, or other areas, but this can also be assessed and addressed. Uh, there's also another part of this bill that I love that provides for nutritious foods to be delivered to homes um, of moms who live in food deserts. This access to nutritious foods can help to boost their immune system and keep them healthy and productive and out of the hospital and doctor's offices. It's true what they say, an apple a day, any of run other fruits and vegetables really does keep the doctor away. Uh, but it also helps to reduce the risk of preventable illnesses and health disparities. Uh, these are just simple things that many of us take for granted, but don't realize that uh, there are many others who don't have access to these basic. And I love the part about direct access. Um, That's amazing, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I know it definitely connects with the environmental justice aspect of it. It, it. There's so many different perspectives to look at this and so many different issues to confront. And I believe this package kind of confronts a lot of different issues while focusing on one major theme of climate risks and things like that. Um, yes, definitely. So as we know, Dr. White, systematic racism has created practices that force minority families to live in places that are more susceptible to toxic air pollution which can lead to illnesses such as heart disease, high blood pressure, asthma, and cancer. In your opinion, how can moms have this kind of conversation about climate change with their doctors? All right, I'm so glad that you asked that question because oftentimes these health disparities experienced by brown and black communities tend to be blamed on race when in fact they're due to pollution. Uh, so you can uh, be frank and tell your doctor that you're concerned that our changing climate is affecting your health and the health of our planet, especially if you have asthma or other lung condition. In my medical training, we focus primarily on cigarette smoke, dust, pollen, mold, cat, dander, um, and family history as being uh, reasons for asthma, severity, or exacerbations. But now we realize that these lung conditions are actually associated with air pollutants like particulate matter, ozone, nitrous oxides, um, that we don't screen for and don't even ask about. Uh, in fact, air pollution may explain why inhalers and nebulizer treatments may not be working for our patient or why their asthma um, is uh, uncontrolled uh, or with um, when the triggers are controlled. Here in Atlanta, we had a wildfire in North Georgia several years ago that covered the city in for two weeks and that brought a lot of patients in for asthma flare-ups. Uh, so we, as physicians and healthcare providers, it's good for us to realize the whole context of, you know, the environment that we live in as it relates to the symptoms that our patients are coming in to see us. Uh, moms can also have this conversation about climate change if, you know, they or their child is ever diagnosed with a heat stroke or other heat-related illness. In clinic, I discuss climate change when I complete sports physicals. I may include a recommendation on staying well hydrated or avoid playing or practicing outdoor sports when it's extremely hot outside or play for a limited number of time, limited amount of time. Um, if your appointment is during a time when you're experiencing extreme weather events such as long or severe heat wave or unseasonably cold temperatures or a pollen explosion, uh, that's another opportunity to talk about climate change and what we can all do about it. Yes, thank you for your answer. And I've been doing, I was part of a, uh, an event for Florida clinicians for climate action last week. And they were talking about with the changing heat and the carbon uh, that's in the air, there are studies that have shown that it has caused pollen to be exacerbated to a level that has never been seen before, causing more and more respiratory issues for people that already have asthma or are going to be developing asthma. So it's interesting that you say that. And, um, I think that's something that we definitely need to think about in a lot of different ways. And, and I've also learned that in the medical field, my sister is also studying to be a nurse practitioner at Emory University in Atlanta. And she is um, learning that some of the practices and, and how they're the teachings of medicine, uh, climate risk and climate impacts are being embedded in some ways in these kinds of practices and how they're educating students on these impacts. So, um, I think that's just really interesting. And that brings me to my next question with, for you. Um, what can health providers do to prepare patients for climate change impacts? It kind of bridges off what you said, but if you can go a little bit more in detail, that would be nice too. 
Uh, yes, so healthcare providers are learning about climate at the same time that our patients are learning about it. Uh, so we can actually get formal um, training on it. I recommend that healthcare groups can connect with other healthcare groups that are already addressing it, like the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, of which Florida Clinicians for Climate Action and Georgia Clinicians for Climate Action are, are um, where state chapters. Uh, the main website, it offers educational materials for healthcare providers and patients, including webinars and opportunity for a fellowship. Uh, health prov care providers can also attend conferences and CME courses on climate change. Uh, you mentioned Emory University earlier. Well, on the 28th of April, uh, we're going to be uh, having a climate health um, education webinar at Emory University. It'll be virtual online. Um, health care providers can also become more familiar with resources on preparing and responding to natural disasters. I can tell you that uh, maybe about a decade ago, I know I need to review it again, but I ended up taking a FEMA course in my community. It was called uh, CERT training. It stood for Community Emergency Response Training, and we teach you first aid skills and just basic common sense uh, skills and strategies on you know what to do in case of a natural disaster. Uh, and you get a big book bag full of tools and it's a weekend course, it's free, it's offered through the fire department. That's an example of something that I recommend everyone take. Um, uh, because, you know, to be forewarned is to be forearmed, and it increases our chances of surviving these events. That's amazing. I love that. And I would love to be a part of that. If at any point we can jump in on some of those classes, because I think it's so important, not just for like regular people to know, but everybody needs to know this kind of stuff to be able to, you know, apply first aid whenever needed to be aware of this. There's so many folks that are not even aware of what's going on. And so to like, you know, maybe something doesn't directly, I know for me, think knock on wood, I've, I've been healthy the most, the majority of my life, but sometimes the people in my family and the people that I love, you know, they do suffer from asthma and they do have respiratory issues and stuff like that. So what may not have affected me, I would not know how to take care of them or how to, you know, bring aid to them if, if, because I've never dealt with that. So these classes, what a phenomenal idea. I think we need to start this all over the state. <laughs> That'd be so good. <laughs> I'm down. Yeah, totally. So, and I need to renew. <laughs> because we do have to keep these skills, you know, updated, you know, and also still be refreshed. Because even though we might learn it, you know, inside of a class, you know, um, when the natural disaster actually occurs, you know, you have to realize, well, where's the flashlight? And how do I do? Do I have this equipment available? Or, you know, that you may not have access to uh, transportation to go to the ER. There might be a flood. There might be a, a wildfire, you know, ahead. So it's good to do as much as you you can do at that point in time. Very much, <laughs> definitely. So let me ask you this, uh, Dr. White. Do you have do you have any suggestions on like how maybe um, to to kind of bring it back down to uh, maternal health and to be able to improve that, especially for Black women and women of color? What do you have any suggestions or what is it that moms can do to help improve their maternal or to like our maternal mortality rate? Because it took for me to join Moms Clean Air Force to really find out about how, how, that, how that works against us, how there are so many um, black moms that are out there that you know, suffer so much more than other moms. Is there anything you can suggest to, to our moms out there that, that maybe pregnant or may become pregnant in the future? Uh, yes, I do suggest that moms uh, do everything that they can do on their own, like make sure you take your prenatal vitamins as soon as you find out that you're pregnant uh, because some nutrition deficiencies can cause some health problems. Make sure you stay up to date with your prenatal visits. You know, they tend to increase more towards the, um, the time of delivery. Um, and most importantly, it's really going to be up to doctors and nurses to do a better job in protecting mothers, uh, because healthcare is a very busy, fast paced environment, whether you're in a clinic or in the hospital. And we find uh, ways to spend um, more time educating moms on healthy habits instead of assuming that it's common sense to recommend 
getting enough sleep, drinks lots of water, eat fruits and vegetables. But actually, we have to really say it. <laughs> we have to enforce it. We have to encourage it. We have to make sure that they are, you know, like, don't just say get lots of sleep, but how much sleep are you getting each night? Are you getting a full night of sleep? Uh, and also doctors and nurses can become more vigilant in their care of black and brown mothers, uh, making sure that they dot every I and cross every T, uh, address every abnormal symptom, vital sign, lab, and diagnostic study, uh, so that whenever a problem or complication occurs, we don't have to blame it on implicit bias or benign neglect. You know, I also advocate for every black woman to be tested for vitamin D. And also make sure that you know your level, what number is it, and be prepared to take supplements if your levels are not optimal. Um, studies are showing that vitamin D deficiency is linked to just about any health condition uh, that you can think of relating to the lungs, the heart, the bone, the immune system, um, even depression. And this may sound shocking, but it's extremely rare for me to find a Black woman with normal vitamin D levels. So everyone, please get really have a positive impact. Wow, that's, that's so powerful. And I know that I myself, when I was pregnant, I didn't get nearly as much counsel and as opinions, and I was not encouraged to ask questions. I know a lot of the times, that, especially when I was pregnant, I was just, I mean, my body was going through so many different emotions and thoughts at the same time. And then being so young at the time, I was just almost embarrassed to ask questions because I didn't want to seem like how could you not know that you're going to be a mom and like I'm I'm little it's my first time doing this I don't know what I'm doing and it's so different for every woman and these especially with this last year and the pandemic and so many people being cooped up inside the house and that you know being indoors a little bit more than normal that vitamin D deficiency can really spike up for some of these ladies so those are it's so important to get that out there thank you so much that's a great great suggestion asking questions and just being more vocal with your doctors is so important. I know that, you know, in my own personal experience and the experience of the moms that I, that I know, some of them have, were almost like told not to ask questions. Like you're asking too many questions or you're just too embarrassed to ask simple things like that. So that's, that's so powerful. And, and that one suggestion is, has the potential to save how many babies? Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> Right. And I love questions from parents because it it gives me assurance that they understand what I'm talking about. They understand their medical condition. They understand our treatment regimen. Um, and if they understand that we can get better outcomes. Absolutely. And that's why we're having this conversation, right? I mean, I'm learning, I'm learning new things just in this conversation. So I think it's a conversation that we have to continue to have. And, and it brings me to this next question. What is your call to action for moms who want to start to do more? Uh, I know at Moms Panthers, we have our agenda and action uh, items for our moms, our members, but what, what, as a clinician, as a, as a person in the healthcare um, world, what would you suggest? Yeah, I know moms want to be superwoman and do everything they can to protect their child and their child's lungs, you know, but, but climate change is so big and so universal that the most important thing that moms can do is demand that their elected officials pass strong clean air laws and strong climate policies, such as this mom the bus package. I am so proud of Moms Clean Air Force for making it so easy to engage with lawmakers because I joined the email list, I clicked the button to sign a petition, and I got a response from all my members of Congress, um, the three, two sen both senators and a representative. Uh, you may discover that your elected official already has a history of supporting strong clean air policies, and you can continue that conversation. Um, I also encourage moms to um, to conserve their own energy usage. You know, like drive less, walk more, bike more, uh, look into wind, solar, solar, and other renewable energy options. Uh, they discover more ways to weatherize your home. Keep the lights off as much as possible, especially when at home. Um, and also be mindful of your use of heating and air conditioning. Consumers use a lot of energy, especially models, so make sure you turn it off, hibernate, or sleep when not in use. Uh, Moms can also take steps to improve their indoor air quality. Uh, the number one way is to increase 
ventilation. So turn your ceiling fans on, uh, open up the windows, except days like today, where we have a high pollen count. <laughs> um, make sure your HVAC system is always set to on instead of auto, so you can keep the air circulating. And also just remember that healthy people take extra steps to protect themselves and collectively these steps to improve our health can also improve the planet. Well, you heard it here. Yeah, straight from Dr. White, we have homework. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta write those down because I can't remember all that. But yes, thank you, Dr. White, for those suggestions. Because some of those things I didn't even think about. Yeah, or some of them like even just keeping like changing out your filter because I don't see my filter like out of sight, out of mind. And sometimes mm -hmm. like there was, I think the last time I had switched it out. I think like two months had passed, like what's happening here? So just making sure tiny little baby steps eventually will make a huge impact on the family. And especially living here in Florida, we get so much sunlight. It's okay to be in the shade and it's a lot cooler there too. So, mm -hmm. but small little steps like that and things that we may not even think of, you know, walking more. I know that people like walking, I will never walk to the store, but like, why not? We're cooped up all day long. It's good cardio. You get to burn off some of those pandemic snacks you've been eating all day long. You get to you get some vitamin D while you're out there, and you get to literally unplug from everything that's going on. It feels like we've been sitting at our desk, just plugged into computer screens. So much more as of late. I know, right? That outside, like I love tossing out my trash now. Check the mail. Let's go. Like I'll walk around the entire building just to check my mailbox, just to get a little bit extra, few few extra feet of, of outside time. So, and sometimes we kind of lose sight of that because we're so busy worrying about moms and being moms and the babies and this, and the world kind of takes over. So sometimes a small little reminder, like, hey, don't forget to change out your air filter can be huge. And it's going to make such an awesome impact. And the fact that we're hearing it, the doctor said it, ladies, the doctor said it. <laughs> doctor has <right>. orders. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, sometimes as, as women, we think that's a man's job, you know, to... <laughs> Go in the basement or in the garage and, you know, find the air filter, the HVAC unit. Mm -hmm. You know, the home where I live in now, I actually have to use a, a drill. It's like drilled in. And so I have to actually unscrew it and, you know, find it behind the electrical wires and change it myself. And also I have to make sure that I use the highest quality air filter mm -hmm. you know, because I care about my the air that I breathe. You know, I also keep plants inside my home and definitely inside my bedroom because plants do to clean the environment. Uh, we give them carbon dioxide, they give us oxygen. We have a symbiotic relationship with them. And also, you know, some communities don't, um, some people live in communities that are not walkable. You know, here I know in Georgia, the supermarket might be um, a quarter of a mile away, but there's no mm -hmm. way they're gonna walk. They're gonna get run over by a car. Uh, we don't really have um, sidewalks uh, where, where I live. Uh, so sometimes, you know, just spending time in your backyard or in the uh, front yard, you know, getting that sunlight, getting that vitamin D that <laughs> can make a difference. Spending time in, in nature, you know, just breathing in that fresh, clean air, going for a nature walk, even just around your house, you know, just getting grounded. Um, and just getting more connected with nature ov overall can really have a positive impact, not just on our health, but our physical health, but also our, our mental health. Because that's really important too. Some people may experience climate anxiety or eco-anxiety. You know, what's going on with the planet? It's so big, we're destroying the planet. I thought, well, what, what do we do? It's so big. What can I do? But we all can uh, take a step and, uh, in, in the right direction by just making small changes, small interventions, and keeping these types of communication going. The more we talk about it, the more it's on our mind, the more mindful we are about it. And we really have to push with this Momnibus package. And I'm so proud of Mom's Clean Air Force for really. Um... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Mayu. And, and as she kind of already said, uh, you can sign on to our petition that's on our Mom's Clean Air Force website, momscleanairforce.org, in the Take Action tab. And you just kind of stick your name in there, your zip code, and it automatically directs right to your elected official. So it's pretty, it's just as easy as that. Um, but 
But yeah, the doctor's in, the doctor's orders are in. <laughs> the doctor's orders are in, and now you have Gabby and myself to back you up with the with the megaphone of mom. So you can't lose. You can't lose when you join the force, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. But Dr. White, thank you so much for your knowledge. Thank you so much for your expertise, and thank you so much for your advocacy. It is much needed, and we need to continue to have these conversations in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you all, and I'm looking forward to it. We were saying, my name is Jadisa, and here in the state of Florida, we are honored by our guest, Suzette Boyette. As a board-certified women's health nurse practitioner, Suzette has practiced in many settings over the past 25 years, from small private OBGYN practices, nonprofit community volunteer clinics, UCS Student Health Center, uh, adjunct uh, faculty at UCS, College of Nursing, and now currently she's at a private OBGYN with over 10 providers in Celebration Florida. She's also a member of several professional organizations, such as the Florida Nurse Practitioner Network, Nurse Practitioner in Women's Health, and the American Nurse Practitioner Association. That's amazing. Now, while raising three beautiful children of her own, she wore many hats in the community, such as a podcaster, writer, speaker, and a volunteer at various organizations, such as the Choices Women's Clinic. When she and her husband had their own podcasting company, Parents Everywhere, they're often, they often volunteered at Earth Day events, teaching parents how to make healthier choices with their families. That is amazing. She gets even better. Suzette loves to combine her passion for maternal fetal health and women's health and empowering women of all ages with real tools that they have in their individual toolbox. Whether it be young girls at a juvenile detention center, pregnant teens at the beta center, or women in her current practice seeking preconception or pregnancy counseling, Suzette uses practical information to help them understand and navigate the next steps in making healthier choices for both mom and baby. I mean, we are absolutely honored to have her here and to be able to really ask some awesome questions and really get some good information, not just for moms, but for all concerned citizens that we have here, not just in the city beautiful, but in the great state of Florida. So let me stop talking so that we can go on to our awesome guest Suzette and really get this conversation started. What do you say? I just wanted to say welcome. And before we have this conversation, I just wanted to kind of create a backdrop of the Mom and Bus bills package just for everyone to know. So the Mom and Bus is a suite of 12 individual bills that address every dimension of the Black maternal health crisis. The Momnibus seeks to transform the lives of Black mothers and babies for the better. This act includes legislation that is groundbreaking because it explicitly addresses climate, climate change related risks for pregnant women, and climate change is a health threat that makes wrenching health disparities worse. The Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act, led by Congresswoman Underwood in the House and, and Senator Ed Markey in the Senate. This act is filled with robust investments and initiatives to reduce exposure to extreme heat, air pollution, and other environmental issues that affect pregnant and postpartum people and their infants. It will provide different, it will provide direct assistance to pregnant women in high-risk communities by providing air conditioning, subsidizing home weatherization, increasing the tree canopy, training doulas and other birth workers, and investing in research in climate and maternal uh, health. These programs will pave the way for healthier moms and babies and easing the maternal health crisis while responding to the real and present dangers of climate change. So with that in mind, we'll go on with our first question. So Dr. Boyette, we can talk about just our first question is, is there any part of this bill, and I know I sent this to you ahead of time so you can kind of do your research on it. Is there, is there any part of this bill you feel have the greatest impact on families, especially based on your experience? So thank you so much, both of you, for inviting me, first of all. And I'm so excited to discuss this bill because I am rather impressed. I was um, talking with Gabriella a little earlier before we started recording at how comprehensive this truly is. And so in answer to your question, um, I had to really consider the last 12 um, parts of the bill. But what I feel is the most important is actually the Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act. 
um, the two parts of that that really stood out to me was that it provides training to healthcare providers to be able to identify climate change risks for patients. And the second part was supporting doulas, community healthcare workers, and other perinatal health workers who can identify climate change related risks and support to patients. So those two things out of that first part really stood out to me because to me, it's so important to provide information. And um, as you had so kindly introduced me um, with that introduction, I um, have primarily worked in, in the private arena with OBGYN practices, a little bit volunteering here and there. Um, I did my clinical rotations through health departments, um, graduating from the University of Florida. So that was about 25, 30 years ago that I did that. Um, but now working in private practice, what I find is that these two things we are lacking. We are totally lacking in the training, both in our own private practices as well as community health centers. Looking at, um, for example, the list that the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology have on certain questions that we should ask, I find in my own experience, and again, just speaking from my own experience, not for um, everyone else in the OBGYN arena, I find that we are lacking in that area, asking specific questions um, and also having specific time allotted for our patients. So again, going back to my experience with a private OBGYN practice, we have a nice balance of Medicaid, self-pay, as well as private paying patients. However, with the system that we have, to be truthful, we're expected to see patients in a 15-minute time slot. And it's very challenging to teach patients about how to um, consider climate change. How does that affect the health? How do, you know, just the heat waves, for example, in here in Central Florida, right, in Orlando, it's crazy. We don't have enough time, I feel. Now, if a patient comes in asking questions or is in a particular, um, I guess, zip code where there's maybe high um, or actually poor air quality, for example, you know, I will try and spend more time. But do I know those exact questions? Not really. We don't, I don't have adequate training. And looking back as a nurse, um, going through nurse practitioner school, I can't speak for physician assistants or, um, you know, doctors and all the other health allied professional um, professions out there. I don't know what that looks like, right? So for me, just providing the adequate training, but then in addition to that, is that time? Do we have enough time to spend time? And then if we do spend half an hour, then it puts our whole day, you know, kind of the whole schedule out of whack. And it's very frustrating and very challenging. And I find that I have to talk a little bit more, you know, just kind of um, gloss over some areas that I wish I could spend more time. And then if not, then I have to have them come back and talk about that. So that's one thing. And also here would be adequate um, training and information is the providing of adequate educational materials. Do we have that? That's very important as well. And then one of the other things that this also brought to me about or brought to my attention was other parts of this act was providing support, including housing and transportation assistance for patients who face the risk of extreme weather events, like for us, for hurricanes. And what if there's flooding? What if um, all of a sudden we have a cold snap? And, you know, speaking of, you know, when people were like in Texas, for example, and but we don't have that, but extreme weather conditions, are we prepared for that? Are we empowering and giving our patients that information? So then I started thinking a little bit more because then the, the bill started continuing on providing patients with air conditioning units, appliances, filtration systems, weatherization support and direct financial assistance. That's all great. But then once you provide that, do we have an infrastructure in place, a referral network where we're able to maybe just make a quick phone call and then that patient actually has that resource? Well, okay, they have the resource, but will they know what to do with it? I know that, um, I believe it's Advent Health. They have a wonderful system where they have a patient navigator. I love that. They're navigating through all of these different things. It would be great if this bill, as well as the other um, parts of this, um, of the Momnibus Act of 2021, if they actually have delineated 
more funding grants to that so that we have patient navigators that once you give them the referrals, patients may not know what to do, how to ask, how to navigate through that. It would be great to have a one-stop shop. I could keep going on and on about this one. This is just one out of the 12. It's fascinating. It's fascinating to me and um, a challenge, I think, that we are ready for, especially with everything that's been going on with our government and society and being more um, aware of social activism. This is a great, this is a great place to start. That is so true. And and you're so right on so many of that. Like you're right. We can keep talking about just that one part on so many different levels, but being able to navigate that is it can be very overwhelming. And here in Central Florida, we have such a colorful population. Yes. And a lot yes. of times there is a massive language barrier. And it's and we need to recognize that it's not just Spanish. We have so many folks here from different nations that we need to be able to translate all of this information because we've, we've got moms from literally all over the world here. So we need to make sure that if we're gonna be able to provide for them, that it is that we're giving them everything and not just kind of setting them up and you know putting a check in the box. Oh, we can keep going, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move on to our next question if, if that's okay with you. Sure. And we all recognize that like climate uh, change is a huge threat to everyone. And, but the effects we all know are not felt equally. Communities of color and low income communities have been facing or have been facing the greatest risk because they're hit first and the worst by climate change, which is heartbreaking. It, it, it breaks my heart, especially being such a, a, like I said earlier, like such a colorful population. We have folks here from all over the place. How can moms have this kind of conversation about climate change with their doctors? Like what kind of what kind of things could they ask or, or how can they even feel like bring this type of conversation um, to their doctors? Well, you know, this question um, actually kind of stumped me a little bit because again, to be honest, and I'm thinking back in my last 25, 30 years, and I know climate change has been more and more of an issue as we have gone on in our timeline, right? I honestly find that moms don't ask. It is not a question, right? Climate change, that climate change um, phrase, honestly, has not entered that um, the, the vernacular of our, of our patients. And again, student health center at UCF, um, community centers, private practice, those terms have not. So I think it's up to us as healthcare providers to bring it up. And, you know, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so... For us, I think, again, and I love the fact how Gabriella and yourself, Yuritsa, you've talked about how this is coming in the forefront, and it is our responsibility as healthcare providers, as perinatal workers, as the social workers, everyone that takes care of patients of, of all ages with um, preconception, conception, it all starts with us, is what I think. So with that said, um, one of the things I think that we can encourage moms, and again, this kind of leads towards later of our conversation, is to start talking about conception before they want to conceive, to talk about how to live healthy lifestyles. And, you know, and, and again, asking, where are they living? Is it here in Central Florida where it's hot? Is it up north over, you know, northeast where it snows, where there's hurricanes, all these different things? You have to ask, what are they doing to stay healthy? Not only with what are they eating, and um, the, the laboratory testing for routine testing, but it's also about the environment, right? What do they do when they go out? And again, I can only speak here in Florida, right? When you go out, do you know the hottest times of the day? You know, how do you keep safe? How do you keep your skin safe? Do you know how to hydrate? What are those signs and symptoms? You know, those are, those are things that we can start the conversation. And then if it then leans towards the term climate change, you know, sometimes I kind of wonder with some of our patients, it may actually go over their head or they might not be willing to listen in the way that we deliver the message. And again, it goes back to the first question. It's about that training. I'm honestly, I don't know those right words. And so when I do bring up topics, I'll maybe kind of make a little bit of a face because I'm like, eh, what do you think about this? You know, the wrinkle of the nose. And then they like that. <laughs> Real about that, you know, and I'm like, so you know, this is what, what did you think about this latest thing? And now that we're talking about this, I was just talking to Gabrielle earlier that this inspires me to come up with information packets for our patients to kind of think outside the box. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So, and again, so how do moms start it? I think it begins with us healthcare providers. It could be in whatever way. It could be the primary care when they go in, when they're maybe checking, um, like now, for example, all the vaccinations that are out there. People that are there, they can actually start to ask questions, plant the seeds so that then they can, it's it's a ripple effect. So that's that's kind of my answer on that one, even though it kind of stumped me. So, you know, I, honestly, I haven't had any patients to ask me specifically. But again, it begins with training and information and education for us healthcare providers. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, like it, it's first noticing that, wait a second, these questions are not, they aren't being asked. So what can you do as a healthcare provider to start asking these questions or to just start the conversation in general? And I know with my sister, she lives in Atlanta and she's studying to be an MP and mm -hmm. her nurse practitioner. And she, you know, she was telling me about how there's been a shift and the teaching methods within kind of the healthcare world, because they're talking a lot about, about the intersection of health and yeah. the climate crisis and climate impacts. So it's interesting that you say, like, right, you don't have you don't have the, the, the knowledge in this, you weren't trained on this. And it's 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 interesting to see that now it is becoming a thing that's being a part of the training, right? Something that we all have to get educated on in a sense that we probably didn't think about before. And what brings me to this next question is kind of what we were talking about before. What can healthcare providers do to prepare their patients for climate change impact? So in your case, what would you suggest from what you know right now mm -hmm. for your patients in the wake of climate change impact, extreme heat, air pollution, things of that sort, asthma, allergies, those kinds of things? What would you suggest or what would you think of suggesting to your patients? Well, again, um, now that... Um, we are discussing this topic and bringing it to all of our attention. One of the things that we can do to prepare our patients is to base kind of ask where they live um, because of, of the climate, right? So even though we're here in central Florida and right now my patients, again, even though we are located in Celebration, Florida, they travel from all over central Florida because of 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, it doesn't really matter. But we can start there and asking, where do they live? Do they live in the city, for example? Is it in downtown Orlando? Celebration is, they don't really have a downtown celebration, but is it downtown Orlando? Or um, are they by a manufacturing plant? You know, things like that, that we normally wouldn't ask. That would be a great way to um, kind of begin the conversation and to prepare there. Also, um, again, when hurricane season, right? Hurricane season is half the year for us here in Central Florida, right? Six months. So during that time, it would be a great idea to um, start the conversation with our patients about hurricane safety and then asking where they live, whether it be an apartment or a house or a condominium or with several members of the family. Are there, are there more than one or, or is there an extended family, right, under one roof, right? Are, are there more than six, eight, ten people to kind of consider all of that and ask, do, do you have the preparations for hurricane preparedness, right? Because when what if the electricity comes out? Do they have access to a generator? Do they know that, hey, how long the refrigerator, you know, um, if the electricity goes out, how long the food lasts in there? What kind of what kind of things are they aware of? And what if there was flooding because of all the rain, depending on if like Claremont, for example, is a perfect um, example, there are hills. There's so many hills in that area of, I guess, kind of central Florida. Well, when there's lots of rain, is there flooding? Do they know signs of mold and, you know, what's the air quality like, right? So those are things that we can start with. Um, and again, like I had mentioned previously, reviewing signs and symptoms of hydration. Do they know how much is adequate fluid? When it is the hottest time of the you know of the year, are they um, seeking cooler shelter? How's their air conditioning working? Is it working at all? What about the fans in their house? Do they you know what about um, enough water? And if they don't like water, well, what are some other alternatives? Could it be popsicles, right? Could it be you know lemonade and you freeze it the old-fashioned way? Growing up, I did that you know with the Tupperware little things, <laughs> you know those type things. We you know simple things that they can do and understand to increase their hydration if they don't like water. Um, how to, um, I'll have some patients, for example, if they don't like water, I'll um, tell them to get some water bottles and put frozen fruit in there, right? Or maybe um, adding, you know, lemon slices or cucumber, you know, just different things to make them more um, 
aware of different ways to hydrate. If they don't like water, there are these alternatives. And then another thing here in Central Florida um, with the climate change and increasing heat, right, is allergy season. This has been one of the worst seasons ever. Well, we can talk to our patients about that. If they have asthma, if um, they have any respiratory diseases, let's, let's discuss those things, how they can um, decrease the allergens. What are some over-the-counter things that they can do? How can they keep themselves safe, especially if they're pregnant? Um, we do have a little book at work that we're able to give them that lists these things, but sometimes they forget about that book. So each time they come in for a visit, we review so that they know what's safe, what's not safe, what they can do. Maybe not even using over-the-counter medications. Maybe once they come from the outside, they can jump in the shower or use a neti pot, things like that to kind of help. Um, and again, it starts with us. And another uh, one other thing that I was thinking about was, um, you know, I we do ask what type of work they do. And we don't have many people working in factories. However, recently I've had several pregnant patients working for um, Amazon. And they're working in an enclosed space where they're working with boxes and packing and very physical. So we've discussed, um, especially now wearing a mask, right? So it's about air quality. Are they able to breathe? What's the temperature like there? Make sure you have the water. Make sure you have time to rest. So a lot of, it's a very comprehensive thing. And again, can all this be fit in 15 minutes, right? So that's, that's again, the challenge, right? So it's helpful to give them um, handwritten educational materials. And what's great about pregnancy, especially, we see them frequently. So there are wonderful things that we can do to reiterate and bring it up. And we also offer um, accessibility to call in the office at any time. Then that way they know that if they have a question, we're here for them after hours. We have after hours, um, uh, after hours answering service where they can speak to a doctor if needed immediately. So there's so many different things that I in a nutshell, asking about um, where they live, what type of work do they do? Are they aware with extreme um, weather? Do they know how to um, have access to clean water? Do they know how, you know, when, if, if it gets too hot and they have trouble breathing, if they have a respiratory issue, how to, how to navigate that as well? So yeah, I think that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> For now, and then there's more later on. <laughs> as we come up with more and more solutions. Those are all just amazing ideas. And and the fact that we're able to just, you know, start putting some stuff together, you're, you're even thinking about putting packages that are already together and we're here on the fly in the middle of conversation. I mean, once we start having these conversations and it becomes more normal instead of as taboo or as hush hush as it is now, can you imagine the, the level of impact we're gonna have on these new little babies that are coming through, right? How great. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Everybody. Oh, there she is. <laughs> this was your face. Oh, that's okay. I live like right by the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Issues and um, problems during their pregnancy. 
and leaning more into that to find out that more that um, our black moms are out there that the mortality rate is just so much higher. That was something that was never brought to my attention or I didn't even know about up until just the, the last few years. That's super heartbreaking. So do you have any suggestions on how maybe we can improve maternal mortality, especially amongst our black maternal mortality rates? Like, is there anything that maybe we can start talking about, start asking about, maybe even just maybe passing on information to our friends and neighbors? That's a mouthful. <laughs> but yes, yes, I do. I do have a lot of suggestions, actually. Um, and again, looking back at the Momnibus Act of 2021, um, I was looking at the different things and there are two suggestions um, that I have that kind of cascades into a whole bunch of other ones. But the first two was about discussing the Social Determinants for Moms Act and also the Perinatal Workforce Act. And both of these acts um, basically talk about um, focusing on social determinants of health is an important step to addressing root causes and how funding, providing guidance, giving information to healthcare providers of all sorts, nurse practitioners, nurses, physician assistants, um, social workers, everyone that works with pregnant moms and moms to be, right? So my suggestion is, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm going kind of back a little bit, again, empowering our healthcare providers. We, and we, we touched upon this um, earlier in our conversation with um, nursing school, medical school, physician assistant school, and how I remember way back when, I love good old days when I was back in nursing school, um, and like cell phones weren't even really out yet at that point. That's how far along ago it was. <laughs> but what I really loved was that my community rotation for my bachelor's of science in nursing. So I wasn't a nurse practitioner yet. I was a nurse and we had a community rotation. And what was so great about this community rotation was that we went out in the community to teach different groups of people, African-Americans, Latinos, um, children, uh, people in nursing homes. So more, um, I guess, uh, lower socio socioeconomic status areas where we taught them how to brush their teeth, um, hypertension symptoms, right? So we could start off there. Wouldn't it be great if each um, school actually made that a mandatory part of their rotation where they had to do a community rotation where they, we can make it specific to maternal health. And let's start with um, when they're young, right? Just young and start with how to make the right food choices, talk about vitamins, making the right choices prepping their bodies so that they know what the next steps are when they do decide to start a family. So they already have a healthy start. And we know with um, these communities, it's kind of um, a circle, right? So mom and grandma, they did this, they did this. We always ate this way. We always ate this type of food. We all, so it tends to be passed down generation to generation. And there's nothing wrong with that. But now that we have more information and their changes with our food quality and our air quality, and we can keep going on and on with all of those, we have to be able to start that. And what a great way to start in each um, educational system with our healthcare providers and starting that as a mandatory rotation. Wow. Um, another, so another thing that I was considering was, um, wouldn't it be great also if just us as a community, we could go out and target maybe churches or gyms or areas where it could be, you know, a grocery store where maybe there's a community event where we talk about how to have healthy moms and healthy babies. We can even target it on climate change or, you know, just all these different things that make them more aware, but go to areas where it's not so clinical, right? Where it's mm -hmm. more open. And churches are great. When I first started, when I was a stay-at-home mom and um, then eventually went back to work part-time, I went to different areas. I talked to mom's groups. I went to preschools. I did go to church groups to where we had moms or I went to the, um, the teenage pregnancy centers, right? To where you can have these conversations and then after you present a topic, you have the mask away. Well, thank you, Suzette, so much for taking the time out to have this conversation with us. 
we have your contact information, so trust that we will be contacting you a lot in the upcoming months. <laughs> we I look, look forward to working with you. <laughs> and I look forward to working with the both of you, and I am so honored to have been asked and to be able to share as much information as I can. And again, Yuritza, you live here in Orlando. We need to set that coffee date. Yes. Yes. Don't threaten me with a good time. I'm all about the coffee. You can ask any of my teammates here. I love coffee. <laughs> and Gabriella, you're not far. It's just a two-hour drive by four. Yeah, if we need to drive to the coast, then if we must. There. Oh, oh. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you. It's such an honor to speak with the both of you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for your advocacy. We really appreciate your knowledge. And yes, like Yaritza said, cannot wait to work with you. Whenever you get those packages ready to go and you want to get some resources and pamphlets for moms of the Air Force, we'll be happy to support you in that as well. Oh, absolutely. I'm on it. Go means go. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Bye, guys. Thanks so much for that. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in at the Florida Table Talk. We'll uh, see you next time. Bye, moms.